So, um, tonight's teaching is going to be about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So you could take your Bibles and go to the book of Daniel, chapter 2. And while you're going there, a little bit of background. The prophet Daniel lived in the time that Judah was in captivity in the land of Babylon. And Daniel was amongst those who were considered worthy to stand in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. In the book of Daniel, we see some of the events that took place in his life, which include visions and understandings given to him of God. Four times we see in this book the revelation given to Daniel, where God reveals great truths regarding things to come. As we look at the visions and the revelations given to Daniel, it's easy to jump to conclusions and sometimes people want to jump in with their own guesses and theories. But the revelations given by God to Daniel are always to be explained within God's word itself. We don't come to God's word with our guesses. We allow the word to speak. We allow it to reveal to us what these things mean. The revelations given to Daniel, they're in chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, and the second half of chapters 9, all of 10 and 11. Those three chapters contain what is one revelation. So there's four all together. And they all tie together. This first one that we're going to look at is God painting a picture using broad brush strokes. It's very broad. When we get into the other ones, you know, the other revelations given, um, they, they get into more detail into individual components, individual parts. But we'll start with the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, which lays down, as I've said, in the, a broad brush stroke, what will come to pass over the next five to six hundred years. Now I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. Nebuchadnezzar is not one of the children of Israel. Up at this until, you know, God limited himself for the most part to give his word to Israel. Like Paul says in Romans, God chose the Jews to receive the oracles of God. But here God is revealing what is remarkable truths to this King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the Gentile nations. So um, in Daniel chapter 2, it shows us a dream that God revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar. So this, this, this king had a dream, but when he woke up, he couldn't remember the dream. He then demanded of those in his court, his advisors, his counselors, his magicians, to show him not only the interpretation of the dream, but also what was the dream. And if they couldn't tell him the dream and its interpretation, then the consequences well, they were going to be executed. I mean, how would you like to be in that situation? I mean, this is a dire situation. So let's pick this up in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king and the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is, in tr is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn 
limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you re shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honour. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. So, in the following verses, Daniel learns all about this. And he buys some time that the leader of the guards was sent out to gather the wise men for execution. And Daniel talks with him and he begs him to give him a day and he says, I'll give you the interpretation. He goes back to his three companions that came from Judah with him and they pray together and he asks them to pray. And that night God reveals the dream to Daniel and he also reveals to him the interpretation. When Daniel receives the answer from God, he praises God. He, he humbly, respectfully thanks God. When he goes into the court the next day, he kind of mocks the Chaldeans and the, the soothsayers, the enchanters, the, all, all the people there, because he wants them to know that there is only one true God. And Daniel begins by telling Nebuchadnezzar that God was revealing to him things that would happen in the future right up to the days of the end of this age. So in Daniel chapter 2 down to verse 31, we'll read about the dream. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image, the image mighty, and of exceeding brightness stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chests and arms of silver, in the middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut, was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer th threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. So just to, to recap there, in this dream he saw a statue with a head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the middle and thighs of bronze, legs of iron and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay, and a stone cut by no human hands. Then the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold were all broken and smashed so that the wind blew them away like the chaff on a summer's threshing floor. And the stone became a great mountain which covered the whole earth. What a vision. What a dream. What does it mean? Verse 37. You... You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Do you think that must have stroked his ego something crazy but the, the revelation reveals to us who the head of gold is what does it mean the head of gold is king nebuchadnezzar he was the ruler over the over babylon which ruled from from where babylon is on the east and it's you know um today it's kind of like northern iraq and it heads west all the way to Egypt. He ruled that whole land, which wasn't all of the known world at the time, but the vast majority. He was the king that 
of the greatest empire on earth. So verse 39. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. So, Daniel reveals to Nebuchadnezzar that he is the head of gold, but then he, he just lists there's going to be other kingdoms that come after you. So, in this statue, the different components of different metals represent different kingdoms, different empires. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. It, there's lots of, inter, uh, you know, information that's said and repeated again. It'd be good if you went back and just read the, the, the account uh, in these first few chapters of Daniel. And in Daniel 2.44. In the days of these kings. Of those kings. The God of heaven. Will set up a kingdom. That shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms. And bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. Daniel explains the king's dream and he tells Nebuchadnezzar he is the king of kings in that his kingdom now rules over many smaller kingdoms, that he is a king of power, strength and glory, that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of fine gold. Daniel then goes on to tell him that after this kingdom, another kingdom shall arise after him that will be inferior to him, and after that a third kingdom of bronze. Then shall come the fourth kingdom, which shall be as strong as iron, and as iron is stronger than any of these other metals, it will be strong enough so to subdue all. But as the feet and the toes of this fourth kingdom are made of part of iron and part of clay, this shows that this kingdom shall be divided. It will be partly strong and partly broken. Daniel continues and tells the king that God himself will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and will last forever. This is the stone that was cut without hands and became a mountain that covered the whole earth. So once again in this chapter we learn that Babylon is the first of these great kingdoms. With Nebuchadnezzar at its head, he is the king, the head of gold. And the final kingdom in verse 45 just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, the final kingdom is the kingdom of God that will destroy all previous kingdoms so that, so that they are like chaff that the wind blows away. The dream and the interpretation given to us in Daniel chapter 2 presents to us a grand view a grand overview of kingdoms, empires that will come into power and rule the world right up to the time when God himself overturns these kingdoms, these kingdoms of men, and establish his own kingdom that will cover the whole earth and will leave no traces of these former kingdoms. In this dream and the interpretation of it, God is showing us his great foreknowledge 
And here he is using broad brush strokes and lays the foundation for the visions that will come later in this book. So if I was in your situation now, I'd be thinking, OK, so we know that King Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold and we know that the stone cut without hands is the kingdom of God. Well, what about the other ones? You probably want to know who's the silver and the bronze and the iron. Well, in Daniel chapter 8, we learn that the silver, uh, we're not going to go there, uh, but just to know that it's not made up. <laughs> the silver is the nation of the Medes and the Persians, which do come into power in Daniel's life. The Medes and the Persians simply walk in to Babylon and take it over. The kingdom of brass is the kingdom of Greece. When Alexander the Great went from Greece and went right across to India, and he, he took over so fast, and once again, this is revealed to us once again in Daniel chapter 8. The fourth kingdom of iron, the scriptures don't tell us specifically, but just about everybody agrees that this is Rome. And when you stop and think about this, Daniel lived in the fifth century before Christ. I think people took, give dates of around, I think, 580 uh, when Jerusalem was captured. I'm kind of just going from memory there, so I... I Forgive me if I'm wrong. So God is revealing from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, there's going to be another kingdom that comes up, which is the Medes and the Persians. After that, there's going to be another kingdom that's going to rule. And this is all these empires. These are not just a kingdom. These are empires that rule great swathes of the earth. From Basically, you're going from Iraq, Iran, in the east to Egypt in the west. Some a little bit, you know, that's your main body. You're going to have Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, Greece, and then Rome. And when you get into the other chapters in Daniel, you get into more depth and some information, and it starts talking about the end times and the Antichrist. And in Daniel 9, you, we start to learn about the 70 weeks and the majority, 99% of what we have read here is going to come to pass between the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel that we're reading about right up until the coming of Christ. They are the powers that are in play up until the coming of Christ. Daniel even foretells and prophesies that when Messiah, the Messiah, will be cut off. Nobody would have known that at the time because they didn't understand the death and resurrection of the Messiah. But it's right there in Daniel. But then, and then, so you might say to yourself, well, the stone, the kingdom of God, it smashed the feet of this kingdom. So did that does that mean that happened with the Roman Empire? And this is where things do get more complicated. And I think you have to take into account the 70 weeks that occurs in Daniel chapter 9 and and how that breaks up because basically out of those 70 weeks 69 get completed. One week and a week in that revelation means 7 years. That seven years is still future. It's the final seven years before Christ comes back. So the book of Daniel is an absolute gem in the canon of Old Testament scripture. And there's a great deal we can learn from it. And I think one of the things it gives us is this, what God said is going to happen, does happen. He foretells these kingdoms. And by the time you get to Daniel 11, there are so many details that God foretells. 
Um, so far in my study of the scriptures, Daniel 11 is the most complicated chapter I have ever studied. It is, you need a, you need a history major to walk you through it because they all, he foretells of events and battles and marriages and up and down and this and that. You, you need to know history, but it all comes to pass. They are all historic. We can look back in hindsight and say, yes, this happened, this happened, this happened. This is that, this is the other. It's incredible. So why am I focusing on this? The main reason I wanted to share this is because this vision and this dream given to Nebuchadnezzar and the interpretation given to Daniel, it shows very clearly that the final kingdom, the final empire that's going to rule the whole earth is the kingdom of God. The, the knowledge and the subject of the kingdom of God is not something unique to any one particular denomination. It's not like you can say, well, the Baptists believe in baptism, but these other people, they don't believe in baptism. You make up your mind whether you believe this or that. The kingdom of God is the cent it becomes the, it is the central theme of the whole Bible. It, it we cannot deny that God's plan is to bring about his kingdom. If we have not heard about the kingdom before, that's not God's fault. It's not the fault of the Bible. It's that it's the fault of those that taught us. They, they didn't know it, so they can't teach it. You cannot teach what you do not know. And that's what I love about this is the, the simplicity of it. I mean, you could teach this to a children's fellowship and they would get it. You know, there's all these parts of the statue. They all represent different kingdoms. But what is separate from the statue, separate from man's kingdoms, is a stone cut without hands. It's not man-made. It comes from God. And it says it becomes like a mountain that fills the whole earth. These other kingdoms went from, you know, the Middle East to Egypt. This is going to cover the whole earth. And a mountain is, is, um, is many, many times in the Bible, a mountain is used figuratively to represent a nation. So he's referring to a nation of God is going to come about, the kingdom of God, and it's going to fill the whole earth. That's, that's the, the, the key point of this is man's going to, have different kingdoms people the the balance of power is going to shift uh, but at the end of the day god's going to say enough is enough now you're going to do it my way <laughs> and i did google what major world powers have existed since the birth of christ and the Mongolians, the Mongols were a great power, at, you know, at, at some point. There's been various empires, but nobody, no single empire that I could see has ruled that swathe of land since the Romans. The, the, they say the British Empire, the sun never set on the British Empire. But we, we controlled different, or we, being British, controlled various continents and countries and areas but it wasn't one overriding land mass that we ruled it was a commonwealth america is a vast nation its wealth and its economy economy greatly influences the world you mean the size of america may well equal the size of egypt to iran it probably does i'm not sure but it's not that same piece of land. And there doesn't seem to be a kingdom that has ever replaced these kingdoms from Nebuchadnezzar down to Rome. When we get to the future, to the end times, 
There's going to be an empire. There's going to be a rulership that is going to cover great swathes of land. Realistically, it's going to be a confederate. Just like the feet, part iron, part clay. It's going to be a mixture. It's going to be an amalgamum. But, you know, lots of people talk about the world having a one world government by the time Christ comes back. I think it's more of a confederacy, just like, um, you know, the EU. It's a, a federal state of Europe. Um, it's going to grow in power and influence. And you've got the whole Arab world, the whole Arab League of Nations. There's going to be a unity based on political, financial, economic coexistence. But God knows what he's talking about. God knows what is going to happen. And at the end of the day, when God says he's going to have a kingdom, he's going to have a kingdom. He, he is the ruler. And thank God that God is a God of justice. He is a God of righteousness. And he rules over and over and over again. The Bible talks about God ruling from a throne of justice and righteousness. When we read about the kingdom of God and the leadership in the kingdom of God, it again talks about justice and righteousness. Things are going to be done right. It's not going to be about power. It's not going to be about how much money you've got. It's going to be about what is right and just in the eyes of God. And in the eyes of God, God is loving. God is fair. God knows the heart of man, and he will rule and judge accordingly. So, thanks for that.